Good afternoon, everyone. Perhaps we'll take a start. Uh, welcome to uh, the Parliament House Theatre, for those of you in the room, uh, and thank you for those of you joining us online. Welcome to this afternoon's uh, very interesting symposium. My name is Andrew Banfield. I'm the director of the Politics and Public Administration section in the Parliamentary Library Research Branch. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that where we meet today has been the meeting place for the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples for thousands of years. I also acknowledge the cultures of any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present with us today and the places you are joining us from. Australia has a fairly settled democracy, characterized by secret ballot, Saturday polling, which as uh, a reformed Canadian I find very novel, one person, one vote, uh, and I was told that I would be remiss if I didn't mention the world-famous democracy sausage. The right to vote in Australian federal elections is provided to most Australians who are over the age of 18, but not everyone gets the right to vote. Non-citizens are generally excluded. Those who are under 18, but certainly part of the rich fabric of the Australian society, do not. Importantly, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders continue to be underrepresented in electoral roles. Why do we do it like this? Is there a better way? Should the rules be changed? To discuss these questions, and I'm sure many others, we are joined today by some of Australia's most renowned political scientists. To the presenters, to my left, uh, Professor Lisa Hill is a professor of politics at the University of Adelaide. She has published electoral studies and democratic theory in numerous works and books including compulsory voting for and against. Lisa is also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences. Dr. Darnie Larkin is a Bundjalung Karanakan woman from Grafton, New South Wales, a public lawyer and a senior lecturer uh, in law at the University of Queensland. Her research interests include indigenous self-determination, cultural identity, electoral law, and policy reform. Professor Graham Orr specializes in the law of electoral democracy at the University of Queensland. His books include The Law of Politics and The Law of Deliberative Democracy, most recently with Ron Levy. Graham is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences and the Australian Academy of Law. Finally, our panel chair, Dr. Jill Shepard, is senior lecturer in the School of Politics and International Relations at the Australian National University. She's an investigator on several major electoral studies, including the Australian Electoral Study, the World Values Survey, and the, Australia, and the Asia Barometer. I hope you do enjoy the, the, what promises to be a fascinating discussion for the next hour and a bit. And I'd like to now invite our panel chair, Dr. Shepard, to take over the proceedings. It's up to you, really. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I have uh, notes here, and you've covered off all of them. Um, we, we must have worked together for too long. I know that was really quite annoying. Um, I do have a note that, that comments that, um, well, I do want to co really commend the Parliamentary Library for leading this kind of conversation. Uh, this is the follow up to a previous uh, seminar that the library ran on the franchise act in Australia. Uh, a lot of us don't really talk about enfranchisement in, in 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 Australia. It is something that we, I think we take for granted. I know my students at the ANU, you know, will write at length about our universal suffrage and it's not something that we spend a lot of time interrogating. And so I really commend uh, Andrew and uh, Damon for leading this charge that can feel a little bit, well, inflammatory at times. Um, if we think about enfranchisement as sort of having two distinct dimensions and they're not at all um, completely separate from each other, they're, they're very closely related actually, but one is the kind of deliberate disenfranchisement that Graham and Lisa are going to talk about where we, we um, specifically carve out parts of the population who can't vote, in this case uh, convicted felons with uh, uh, imprisonment, a, a sentence of imprisonment for more than three years, or anyone under 18. Um, the second form is what Dani will be talking about, and that's where we may think uh, that the disenfranchisement is much more incidental, that if we're not going to polling booths in every remote location uh, to allow every remote Australian to vote, um, you know, is it a constraint on, on the AEC's time or is that a sort of deliberately built in, um, you know, 
a fairly entrenched form of uh, deliberate disenfranchisement. And I think to have those conversations, uh, often we probably bite our tongues a little bit, depending on how many electoral commission staff are present. I know they do a, an incredibly good job, but there are, you know, uh, there are some fairly entrenched state disadvantages there. Um, it is really important that we do interrogate that, and I'm really glad that we're doing that today. Uh, my next note says that I note that even the Hicks state of Alberta is allowing same-day enrolment. Uh, so congratulations, Andrew, and your redneck state <laughs> from Canada. <laughs> even we can't do same-day enrolment. And so we do have uh, role models around the world, even in the last places that we may have thought to look. Um, <laughs> So on that note, let's look to Calgary. We'll start with Graham, who is going to talk about um, prisoners' right to vote, or citizens and denizens. Sorry, not just prisoners. Thanks, Graham. Sorry, I've got some PowerPoints. Doesn't mean I have powerful points to make, but... Uh, Do you have? I think... Uh, Slideshow from the beginning. Thanks, everyone. Um, I too should acknowledge that we're passing through Nunnawal. I'm passing through Nunnawal land today. Um, until Wednesday morning, I was I was on uh, Minjeriba Island, uh, which is Kondamooka country in Moreton Bay, and catching the Brisbane to Sydney to Canberra train, uh, I was reminded um, of the breadth and diversity of this uh, of this continent. And also, just coming up here today on the bus, seeing all the government departments that are dotted across the city and then standing under the, is it the biggest flagpole in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, reminded these things are uh, representations and, and, and the reality of the behemoth that is the Commonwealth of Australia and the institution of this parliament, which is all just another way to note that there are other things going on in this building today, including that very obviously this is going to be a very significant year in terms of um, the political relations between and amongst our First Nations people of this continent and our Commonwealth. I also want to thank Damon for the invitation uh, and the taxpayers for paying my fare. And also, I'm standing between you and two of the very brightest and sassiest uh, legal, public or academics and political scientists in Australia. So I should get on with my talk, which, yes, is about citizens or denizens. Denizens, we, we don't... I just wanted to slip that word in because we don't hear it often enough, except in the cliché denizens of the deep, although even the cliché suggests that it's the word, you know, it's a forgotten word about people who are sort of forgotten or, or kept in the dark, if you like, but denizen just means someone who lives somewhere with, without being a citizen. So really what I'm going to talk about today is about permanent residents and their right to vote or lack of the right to vote. And I'll, I'll do it in a, in a few stages. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about the history of the formal franchise, in other words, the law about who gets uh, to enrol in Australia. I'll talk uh, a little bit about comparative law, so we'll look overseas and see which other countries have a more expansive approach to permanent residence uh, and voting. And then I'll talk a bit about um, the, pro I don't know if it's a proposal, but the suggestion by the Prime Minister that we, Australia might enfranchise uh, people from across the ditch, Aotearoa and New Zealand. And we'll think a little bit about the, uh, the principles or, or otherwise behind that. So I get the text. Okay. So, yeah, if we think about it, uh, you know, as Jill suggested, yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, mostly the franchise is very fundamental, but it's also something we sometimes think, oh, it was, it was settled at least sometime, you know, in the last 60 years or so in Australia. Um, and, and maybe even more than that, it's a sort of this. 19th century liberal question about uh, expanding the right to vote. Um, but there are two groups in Australia who, uh, besides prisoners and uh, my, my daughter, who are not able to vote, um, some expat Australian citizens. Uh, so there's very complex rules about um, being an eligible overseas elector. Uh, but you can go overseas for six years and you can keep renewing one year at a time your intention to return and you can still technically vote, although it, it gets quite complex and you can lose that ability to vote if you don't use it. But the Australian diaspora, uh, with apologies to my siblings, uh, it's, it's relatively well healed. It's got a lobby group, the Southern Cross group and so on. It's not, you know, like the even the Italian diaspora after the war or, or refugee diasporas, the South Sudanese and so on. So I'm not too worried about, about their... Um, their political rights. 
Permanent residence, on the other hand, well, Australia is an immigrant country. Most obviously, uh, it's been built th that way. Uh, I think we have the ninth largest percentage in the world of the population living here who are born overseas, for example. Um, so we're going to focus on that, that question. <laughs> so brief history, obviously Australia, uh, as um, the colonisation of Australia from 78 onwards is part of a story of empire, which then moves on to a story of the Commonwealth of Australia in, from 1901 and through the 20th century, and also a story of, of then de developing nationalism throughout the 20th century. Um, <coughs> it's, I guess, a curious thing in a way that in the time of empire, the franchise was in some ways more generous than it is uh, in a time of nationalism or a focus on citizenship. So the original Uniform Franchise Act of 1902 uh, gave voting rights to subjects of the king who had had six months residence. Right, so you had to be a subject of the king with six months residence. So residency is a cornerstone. Uh, it's not just an idea of some formal status you have. Um, in most countries, you need to be a resident uh, because then you're affected day to day by the administration and the laws. Relatively famous or infamous is, is the racial exclusion that was already baked into most colonies, but uh, continued until 1962 as part of the white Australia policy, um, which is partly about the white Australia policy, but also partly about the policies of uh, assimilation of the definition of half-casteness in relation to Indigenous Australians who are either uh, corralled, excluded, pushed to the margins, expected to die off, or who were to be assimilated and, and drawn into white society, were given political rights, but were uh, often economically and socially um, second-class citizens, if you like. Less well remembered is the fact that the original Uniform Franchise Act gave an exception from that exception to allow Maori in Australia to vote. And that's an interesting uh, point, both because uh, the, from the early days of the, the colony, there were quite a lot of Maori working in places like Sydney and so on. Why were Maori uh, let out of all, of all people of, of, uh, of non-white um, blood and so on? Well, because uh, we wanted New Zealand to be the seventh uh, state, and you, you see that in, in the Monica Avenue, is it in, in, in Canberra, and so on. And, and Maori were enfranchised, albeit corralled at those days, into reserve seats in the New Zealand par Parliament. So there was a concern that we, well, why would New Zealand want to join, particularly New Zealand Maori, if they were going to lose some of their political rights if they became just a state in Australia? All right. Um, it's not until 1984 that the it was not until 1948 that citizenship becomes a, a legislated status in Australia, uh, alongside the idea of subjects of the Crown. It's not until 1984, uh, on that, it looks like a, sim a symbolic date, but as Michael Maley reminds me, this bringing in of citizenship as a prerequisite to be on the roll for all future uh, electors is, mm, it comes into a statutory, you know, a, a, a sort of a indirect legislative modernisation as part of a multicultural approach um, to getting rid of the, the old white Australia policy, if you like. So the exception of that is that there are some permanent residents who were, this is called a grandfathering revision in law, who who's, were on the roll on that date in 1984, and if they're still on the roll and haven't <laughs> dropped off the roll, they can still uh, maintain the right to vote. Um, but that's a long transitional uh, protection, if you like. All right, when we look overseas then, so part of the story is, yeah, part of empire, it was actually much easier uh, to move around, at least if you were, if you were uh, welcome um, and of the right race, but to move around as part of a political citizen of an empire, and it wasn't until 1984 that citizenship becomes a hallmark or prerequisite for new enrolments. All right, if we look overseas, and we did, I did a survey of uh, 100 or so, 104 I think it was, uh, classed as, as semi or full liberal democracies in the world, we see that relatively few of them uh, have an expansive right to vote for all permanent residents. Um, one exception is New Zealand in 1975. The other exceptions are in Latin America, uh, Ecuador, Chile, Uruguay, uh, and Malawi in Africa. Much more common, or at least somewhat more common, is to have arrangements for um, countries that you have some sort of kinship with. So if 
if I go to the United Kingdom, I did study, or if you're an Irish in the United Kingdom, you have the right to vote there, uh, even the right to stand for Parliament without being a citizen of the UK. And then Republic of Ireland reciprocates to UK citizens. We see similar uh, rules either set up in fact or potentially triggerable in the European Union as well. Uh, so you can vote in parliamentary elections in some countries if the other country reciprocates. And then finally, we also see it in other uh, decolonised empires, such as between Brazil and Portugal. Hold that thought in mind, because there is something obviously going on here if we talk about an embrace of a, a franchise for Kiwis. Um, now, Prime Minister Albanese uh, last year, I've got the quote there, saying that he'd asked the Electoral Matters Committee of this Parliament to consider whether there's a way to return to systems that existed in the past. He's referring to the subjects of the Crown idea, I guess, of giving New Zealand people who are here in Australia voting rights. What he means is voting rights for uh, Commonwealth elections, but uh, I guess because of the shared role, it would be something that ideally would apply to states as well. Uh, as for local government, that's a different kettle of fish. I'm not talking about local government here because often we have ratepayer-based franchises, or at least the idea, and in, think in South Australia, uh, you don't even have to be a permanent resident at the moment. You can vote even just as a, a student on a, on a visa in local government. So there's a difference between you know, parliamentary elections, lawmaking elections, and local governments. So what do we make of this uh, suggestion of embracing our Kiwi, uh, I suppose we'll say cousins, that will uh, give away that I don't think this is an unprincipled uh, thing to do, but we have to work through w how or why that might be. Now, you might have heard some gossip around that Labor is interested in this because Labor thinks that uh, uh, the Kiwi diaspora is more likely to vote left of centre than Conservative. I'm so sure about that. I mean, we're talking about people who are largely economic migrants taking advantage of the two-way uh, free movement and free trade zone that we have had for decades with New Zealand. I'm also reminded, um, you know, people like Gough Whitlam and Clyde Cameron said after the fall of Saigon, the Vietnam War, that they didn't want the quote-unquote Vietnamese bolts, B-A-L-T-S, not B-O-L-T-S, uh, flooding into Australia because they feared that uh, for religious and political reasons, they would be opposed to left-wing politics. Well, that fear or prediction, I don't think necessarily turned out to be true in terms of the voting habits of, uh, of Vietnamese Australians. But in any case, whether one can predict these things or know them in advance, a principled argument would be based on principles and not based upon one side or another thing they can get partisan advantage. So where does principle come into all this in something that is as fundamentally political as defying the franchise? Um, it seems to me that there are two arguments, and Michael Maley has made this argument and others before the, uh, the, the joint uh, the standing committee that's looking at this question. One of them would be, well, this would be uh, back to the future. This would be sort of saying we have kinship with New Zealand uh, and these historical ties and so on, uh, and it would just be giving a preference to a certain group of people who have the rights to not permanent residency but to indefinite um, stays in Australia. The other approach, it seems to me, is to say, well, look at each case on its uh, merits and to say, well, New Zealand and Australia do share both a socio-economic as well as a, a political lineage. Secondly, this isn't <laughs> about race because New Zealand uh, is a very much a migrant country as well. Um, so we're talking about Pacifica people. We're talking about a uh, reciprocal relationship, obviously, because New Zealand allows Australian citizens to not just enter and stay and work, but also to vote. Thirdly, the Parliament already recognised that certain political rights of New Zealanders on these special long-term visas, such as the right to donate to political parties and movements and not be considered part of the foreign money that is now largely meant to be prohibited in our system. Finally, I mean, of course, we can think about New Zealanders who, since 2001 at least, have not had an easy access to citizenship, so the barriers in the face of getting citizenship Secondly, they haven't got the same access to social welfare and uh, even tertiary education funding that permanent residents would necessarily have. So there are some substantive questions that may go to their lack of political voice. On the other hand, um, <coughs> we should recognise that uh, there are constitutional questions as well here. Potentially, someone could litigate and say, 
oh, are they people of the Commonwealth? What does this phrase mean in the Constitution? Well, it was originally not intended to mean anything particularly, and obviously for a long time up until uh, 1984, it was accepted that it included permanent residents who were, uh, or residents who were otherwise subjects of the Crown. So it is something that has elasticity, it can change over time. Um, I don't think this is really a concern. Uh, I mean, I know that public lawyers like Professor Toomey and others who always say, oh, be careful about what the High Court will do. Well, no, the High Court mostly um, acts as a kind of barrier. It's the metaphor of the shield protecting existing rights, and that's what happened in the prisoner voting case in uh, Vicky Roach's case in 2006, 2007, and in Rowe's case about enrolment and, and so on. What it says is if you've extended the franchise to a class of people, then you have to have good reason if you're going to take it away over time. We're talking here about extending the franchise. And we're talking about doing it in, in a way that's clearly not irrational. It's not like saying that uh, we were going to enfranchise, say, uh, I don't know, uh, all residents of Argentina or something. You know, it's, uh, we're talking about people who, are, <laughs> who have an indefinite right to stay in this country for economic and other purposes. Uh, I don't quite like the language that the Prime Minister used about paying taxes because I don't think it's a no, no taxation without representation. In fact, we all pay taxes. Every tourist pays tax. It's called the GST. Um, so the court, I don't think we have to worry about the court coming in to override this uh, because it's, it's not irrational or unreasonable. It really is ultimately a political question for the parliament on behalf of the, as a representative of all the people to decide. The other thing I would note is that electorates are allocated, oh sorry, the number of electorates in each state for this parliament is on the basis of the population, which is on the basis of the census, which is on the basis of whoever is in the country at a time. So we have to also think government is about the people in a much broader sense than just those who are over 18 and citizens. Final uh, technical question would be, well, if we were to enfranchise uh, New Zealanders in Australia or any other group of permanent residents, would we make it compulsory? That's what they do in New Zealand, where they have compulsory enrolment, it's compulsory to enrol. Um, you have to, I should say, have been in the country for a year in New Zealand. I think that's what the Prime Minister is thinking of here as well. You have to have had a, a minimum length of uh, residency here. But there are questions there, you know, about groups of people who, who, who may have left New Zealand and may be quite apolitical. They're looking for economic advantage and so on. Are you going, their first experience of Australian democracy might be, you know, a fine for not turning out to vote uh, after they've been automatically enrolled <laughs> um, because their visa status is known. Finally, and to finish off, I want to think about the idea of uh, fancy French word, resentment, you know, it's like resentment, the idea of backlash here. Um, when New Zealand extended the franchise to all permanent residents there in 1975, initially it wasn't considered a radical thing to do. It was really just a kind of extension largely to then uh, British migrants because that was where New Zealand was taking most of its migrants from until uh, the 80s. Only since has it come to be seen as something of a, of, of a very liberal or even radical uh, uh, gesture and law. What, what is interesting here is uh, the, whilst you know, people like Pauline Hanson have, have said she is concerned about uh, New Zealanders' uh, welfare and other rights in Australia, in, in a substantive sense, um, Australia, whilst it's a, a very much an immigrant country, um, I, don't, I don't think we should be naive and think any time in my lifetime we're going to extend the voting right to all permanent residents. The question does become, do you just do it in little bits or to certain privileged groups? Uh, is that going to skew the system? Is it going to skew uh, election results? I don't think so. Is it unprincipled and discriminatory? I've tried to make the argument, I don't think so. But overseas data is interesting because it suggests that those countries that open up more to immigration uh, and particularly to non-discriminatory immigration, are less likely to extend voting rights than more likely. And we can go back and I could show you again that it's more common to have not voting rights for all permanent residents, but for countries with which there was some uh, kinship or uh, historical governmental ties. To think otherwise, I think naively assumes either that immigrants have a cohesive lobby group, which is not the case, or that quote unquote native political forces, uh, nationalist forces would welcome liberalisation. So with that, I'll leave the question hanging for this parliament and uh, hopefully there'll be some ideas, discussion uh, from the floor. Thank you.
cursor. I'm cursing that I've lost the cursor. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> escape? Yeah. Oh, yeah, escape. Any clues here? <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, hang on. Got it. Oh, good work. There's you. Thank you, my dear. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so <laughs> look at me just for a minute thinking, what am I talking about? <clears throat> there it is. I've been giving so many talks lately. <clears throat> I'm talking about lowering the voting age. So my work is mainly around electoral inclusion. Anything I can do to include more people in the electorate is what I'm interested in, anything we can do, uh, because studies have shown, including mine, that that makes a democracy stronger, more responsive, uh, more accepted by the people, and it makes for a population more happy with their democracy. So we want to try and do that. So Australians have recently been considering whether the legal voting age should be lowered to 16 with enrolment at 14. Um, in 2018, there was a bill before the federal parliament that was introduced by Green Senator Jordan Steele-John. It had the support of the Greens and the ALP. It failed to pass because it stumbled on this one condition, which was whether it should be compulsory. ALP wanted it to be compulsory. Greens didn't want it to be compulsory. The JSCM then held an inquiry on it. It took a lot of submissions, all of which I read. It took a roadshow around four different Australian cities. It took witnesses and submissions and things like that. And I read all the submissions and saw you know, what the general sentiment was. And I reported on that in the paper that this is a truncated version of. In the wake of the ALP's uh, 2022 election victory, the Greens have seemingly conceded the ALP condition, which is to not, not make it compulsory, but this is just a matter of wording because they say, we'll have it compulsory, but there'll be no enforcement, which is very silly. That's the same as saying not making it compulsory. So I don't think they've really given much ground there. So we're still back to square one, really. So here are my questions for this talk today. Should the voting age be lowered in Australia, and if so, on a compulsory voting, uh, on a compulsory basis? And did the ALP miss a, a golden opportunity or was it a classic case of uh, parties of the left shooting themselves in the foot for the sake of a principle or perfection? And I conclude that they certainly weren't doing that. They had very sensible reasons. Now, as I go through the arguments, my main concern here is whether, whether or not voting for under 18 year olds is in their interests. After all, they are children and the Article 3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child asks us to take the best interests of children into account whenever we make decisions about them. Now, Ludwig Beckmann, who's one of my interlocutors in this paper and who's against enfranchising 16-year-olds, says that any convincing argument for the exclusion of children should justify why not having that right is a good thing for them, and he thinks it is a good thing for him. them. Because of the interest, he says, they have in the need for play, and it's hard to disagree that children need time to play and have to be free from adult responsibility. And I look at that claim and then I problematise it in the paper. Um, in order to see how I got to my position, I'll just take you through the for and against arguments quickly and, um, and then you'll understand why I'm for lowering the voting age and on a compulsory basis. The equity argument, basically that uh, young people of 16 and 17 year old can drive cars, uh, they can give blood, they can have children, they can serve in the armed forces from 17, uh, they can make medical decisions over their own bodies, they can be tried as an adult, they pay taxes, they work, all those things. They do. They obey laws and they're subject to the laws. Why shouldn't they have the most important right of all, the right to vote? The equality argument. Uh, in a democracy, everyone is to count for one and only one unless there's a morally compelling reason to exclude them and I don't see any morally compelling reasons to complete exclude 16 year olds. The intergenerational justice argument, which I'll come to in a minute, the strengthening democracy arguments, it will certainly strengthen our democracy to include 16 to 17 year olds. And that'll become clear as to why that will be the case as I go along. And of course, representationally, the young are being left behind or else ignored. And that feeds into the intergenerational justice argument. Here are some things to bear in mind. Youth poverty. Partly due to demographic good luck, but largely due to government welfare and tax policies that favour older generations who vote. 
So remember, uh, politicians know who their customers are, voters. And that's who they serve. If you don't vote, they don't serve you. That's just this stark reality many studies have shown. So we, gradually over time, this is getting worse. There's money being transferred from younger generations to older generation. As poverty has decreased for the elderly, it's increased for children over the last decade. So children are more likely, young people and, and children as well, are more likely to be part of a growing precariat of insecure, poorly paid, low status workers. They're less likely to be able to ever own a home, to have good super that, and have job security and that kind of thing. This of course causes psychic stress, it does for anybody, but it's, it's having a particular impact on these younger generations, especially Gen Zs and Millennials. They have very, very uh, acute concerns around uh, financial security. And the other thing is they're increasingly pessimistic about their future. And that's some, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute, but it upsets me. Because when I think back, and I grew up next to a maximum security prison in the poorest suburb in <laughs> Tasmania, and I still, as a 16-year-old, had a sense of prospect around the future. I thought life was going to be great and everything will be okay and I'll work something out. And I did, because I could, because my generation had better moral luck than this generation. The other thing causing anxiety is climate anxiety. It isn't just some trumped up thing. This is a real thing that young people have. And it's associated with feelings of political helplessness, powerlessness, and a sense of betrayal. The older generations have betrayed them and the older generations have betrayed them. It's not a made up feeling. So there was a large scale cross national survey done of, of over 10,000 children um, in a lot of settings. Australia was one of them. And most of the, or more than half of the subjects felt sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and guilty. And I thought guilt was an, quite an important thing there. They were standing by and watching it happen, but not being able to do anything about it, and they felt guilty. And 75% said they think the future is frightening, and I've highlighted that, frightening. Even where I was, <laughs> violence, guns, I got shot. Even where I was, it was an accident. <coughs> Still, people are just shooting guns around. It's Tasmania, 1960-something. Uh, I still thought the future's not frightening, the future's awesome, something good's going to happen to me. I find that very depressing and sad that that's how young people feel about the future and they're not really exaggerating. And they feel that government doesn't respond to them and they have feelings of betrayal. So, so I don't find, I find all those arguments for compelling. Here are the arguments against, I don't find any, any but one compelling. Young lack the political maturity and competence to vote. No, I know we all think about the conversation we have with our teenager and you think that is the most stupid <laughs> pack of irrational nonsense I ever heard in my life. But that's a situation with hot cognition in it. You're fighting or you're, having, you're disagreeing. In the cold cognition uh, settings, which voting is like, it's like a test, 16 and 17 year olds are just as good at casting a competent vote and also a congruent vote. And a congruent vote is when your preferences align with who you vote for. Some people accidentally or don't realise they've voted for the party that's opposite to their interests. The young people are as good or as bad as older people are doing that, of, of casting a congruent vote. So people say their bad decisions will be visited on themselves, that they'll vote for <clears throat> no bedtimes, no internet controls, um, no compulsory schooling. Uh, first of all, this is based on a a ridiculous conception of what the parliament would look like under a lower voting age. It won't be all 16 year olds running around smoking bongs and refusing to go to school. It'll be mostly adults uh, more responsive to young people's preferences. And secondly, we know the young people don't want to make stupid decisions. They don't care about that stuff. They care about the climate. They care about financial security. And they also, the other thing they care most about is First Nations justice. That's what they'll be doing. And then that their bad decisions will be visited on everybody else. Ditto, same thing, they won't, because they're, they're, they're equally good decision makers. There's one argument that seems quite persuasive at first, it's called the all of life of complete life argument. When you first read it, you think, oh, that's a good point. It's this, it's not discriminatory to prevent 16 or 7 year olds from voting because everyone experiences that discrimination universally. We all put up with it, regardless of the secondary characteristics about it, we all have to put up with it. And then you think, oh, well, fair enough, it's not discriminatory. But then. Think of this very simple thought experiment. I say to you, um, universally, we all have to wait till we're 50 till we can vote. Don't worry, you will get to vote when you're 50. Just be patient and watch while the parliament makes decisions and the voters get to have what people over 50 get to have what they want, but your interests are not taken into account. And we immediately think, 
<clears throat> this is not for me. This is not something I want to wait. I don't want to stand by and wait and watch older generations make decisions that aren't in my interest. And finally, that it's not in the interest of these young people to vote because their childhoods will be shortened by allowing them or compelling them to vote. Here's where I am so far in the argument. In terms of their material and psychic, psychic interests and concerns, I think voting is going to be in their interests. A, because they badly need a better representation, and B, because they're capable of voting in a manner that, that will benefit them and unlikely to lead to any significant harms either to themselves or others. <clears throat> so it looks pretty clear to me. But I'm not out of the woods because I haven't dealt with this compulsory voting thing. That's the elephant in the room, and that's related to the right to play argument. Because remember, uh, the people making the right to play argument are Europeans. <clears throat> and I feel like saying, Ludwig, what's the big deal? If someone wants to keep playing, they can keep playing. I'm not making them. Uh, and if they want to vote and stop playing for a little while, then they can vote. But in Australia, if it were compulsory, they wouldn't have the option to keep playing. They'd have to vote. So the stakes get a lot higher in Australia. So, so far, I think I'm arguing that the arguments for and none of the arguments against enfranchising these people are persuasive. Right to play. Whatever happens in Australia, because you've already got compulsory voting for over 18 years, the, costs, the moral costs are more exorbitant than they are in voluntary settings. This is going to occur regardless of whether we make it compulsory or voluntary. If we make it compulsory, the playtime of all Australian children are inevitably infringed. They won't get a say about it. And B, but if made voluntary, it's going to create an SES voting gap that doesn't presently exist in Australia. I'm going to say some more about that in a minute, but that is a very bad outcome for the young. Now, reminding you that the bill faltered in 2018 because the Greens couldn't agree with the ALP and vice versa about whether it should be compulsory. The Greens weren't isolated. Just about everyone that made submissions to that JSCM inquiry wanted it to be voluntary. Even the peak bodies representing youth wanted it to be voluntary. <clears throat> ALP was among a handful of submissions that thought it should be compulsory, and they had good reasons. First of all, that the bill would create confusion. It was a threat to Australia's compulsory voting system, which, as everyone who's read any of my work would know, I'm strongly in favour of. I think it's a good thing. It would introduce confusion as to whether voting or not was, in fact, compulsory. And we all know, or well, everyone in electoral studies knows, your first experience of voting sets, sets a sort of footprint or pattern for the rest of your life. So you don't want to start people off th thinking that, that voting might not be compulsory. And this could long-term uh, depress turnout. Australian voting arrangements are actually already complicated enough, uh, especially in the context of federalism, without adding this to the mix. Next, it created another kind of confusion in that Australians are kind of unique in thinking that voting is not just a right but a duty. And Australians think that more than anyone in any other um, advanced democracy. Denmark's very close behind us, but we think that more strongly than anyone else in a, in a proper, authentic democracy. Voting's not just my right, it's my duty. We know it's a duty under law, because you have to vote. But Australians also believe that it's a duty to vote. So this is, again, creating more confusion. And the problem was that the young people were asking to be released from the double standard of voting exclusion, but to, have, to impose another double standard of having the right but not the duty to vote, and I thought that was a problem. Second, the, the proposed bill was seen as discriminatory. Uh, as Luke Beck put it, there's no material difference between a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old that could justify this kind of law, and so it, um, it violated the Anti -discrimina Age Discrimination Act, and I agree, and the J scheme agreed with that as well. And third, and I thought this was the worst thing <clears throat> about the voluntary, proposed voluntary nature of the bill, that it would exacerbate inequality. And hardly anyone really cared about this or seemed to grasp it, and I thought it would be a really quite awful consequence. It would entrench already widening structural inequalities between social subcategories of young people, privileging the views of those young people who are most engaged and generally most equipped with economic and social capital, and some increasing inequality in political participation. It would advantage better off youth and it would make disadvantaged youth worse off. So it would entrench further and at an earlier age problems that compulsory voting already successfully addresses, socially uneven turnout and political exclusion among the disadvantaged, which voluntary systems all experience, but we don't, or we do so to a lesser degree. 
It would exacerbate the exclusion of poor, called, homeless and otherwise disadvantaged youth while magnifying the political power of school captains and debaters residing in the leafy suburbs of Australia. We all know who will be voting and who will be campaigning and who will be getting involved. This in turn would in fact impact the relative welfare of young people because voters attract government attention and abstainers evoke government neglect. So even earlier on, these young privileged voters would be attracting more government attention. So the AOP wasn't allowing perfection to be the enemy of progress. It was choosing substantive equality over its attractive but deceptive twin formal equality. And people always say this to me when they're com complaining about papers I write about compulsory voting. Oh, it's just the right to vote. That's enough. It really isn't. Voting, the voting right doesn't do its job unless it's instantiated. You actually have to vote in order to get the benefits that voting and the protection that voting gives you. So, so far, it looks like I'm on safe ground. It's stacking up in favour of enfranchising 16 to 17 year olds on a compulsory basis. basis. I'm still not out of, out of the woods because I'm pretending to, but I haven't addressed Beckman's argument about playing. It's not just his, a lot of people say. Children shouldn't have this extra burden at this age. And I would add to that that the burden is exacerbated in Australia because then we've got the problem of penalties. So, and then we're going to potentially involve children in criminal sanctions if they, they fail to pay the, the fine. So this is getting really kind of tricky for me and I'm stuck in a bit of a hard place. Remembering the UN not only wants us to consider children's interests, they ask us to make sure children have the right to relax, play and to join in a wide range of leisure activities. And who can disagree? Who could ever disagree with that? By the same token, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child also asks, asks us to make sure that children have the right to say what they think should happen when adults are making decisions that affect them and have their opinions taken into account. Also, do the potential payoffs exceed the costs of asking 16-year-olds to vote? I think we have to agree that, look, it's going to impinge on playtime and that carefree time. That might be a cost. And is voting really so burdensome? And does it completely obliterate children's world of play? Personally, I couldn't wait to get voting, but, you know, I would say that. I'm a political scientist. I was so excited the first time I could vote. So here are some things to consider, but not everyone feels that way about it, including my son, who's really mad at me about this paper. He's really mad about it when he found out this is what I was talking about today. Here are some things to consider. First, this responsibility is wanted. Australian adults don't want the young to vote. They feel that more strongly than anyone anywhere. Why? That young people would like the right to vote. Second, voting would help them offset their guilt and anxiety at their powerlessness powerlessness to prevent climate change and to protect their financial interests. And I think this would benefit their sense of well-being. We all know we feel better when we get control over things. And, and so not only would it improve their material circumstances, it would improve their mental health. And what's wrong with that? Uh, as a parent of this generation, I know their mental health is, uh, they're more anxious. They are more anxious. And it would give them a sense of prospect about the future, which I would love them to have which I had the luxury of and most people in my generation had the luxury of. And third, it's not a trivial consideration uh, that partly as a consequence of compulsory voting, casting a vote in Australia is pretty darn easy. All the transaction and opportunity costs have been absorbed by the state. They do everything they can to get you to vote. And even when you fail to vote, they, they send you a little pamphlet now. I got a shock when I saw it come in the mail for my son. Why didn't you vote? And it was already there, ready for him to, I think it might have even been a, a free envelope he could put it in to send back, oh, we're sick or whatever. Um, it's so easy to cast a vote here. And fourth and most importantly, I want people to think about this. How much fun are young people having and how much fun are they likely to get? Now, I, I know we see them having fun, but actually what I also see them have, doing is working three jobs to, to, to get ahead or to, to get through uni. I had a job through uni and that was rare. Most of my friends were from Sandy Bay and their parents were paying for them to go to uni. So, uh, but now that's the norm. They have two or three jobs. Also, children's life, lives are just as implicated in politics as those of adults. This is kind of like a very Pollyanna idea of political life. Actually, children are at the pointy end of politics already. And if you think about the life of the, an Indigenous person in this country, the microaggressions, the racism, the exclusions, the everything, that you are thrown into from the moment you're born. We are all thrown into politics the moment we're born. If we have a privileged childhood, we are thrown into politics, the politics of privilege. 
but we're all in a political realm. Children don't need to be protected from political life. It's not like people act like political life is dirty and wrong and bad. You know, it's not. It's life and everyone should be involved in life and considering their interests. And so the minorities at the pointiest end of this point yet of childhood will be the same children that are disenfranchised under the voluntary system. The advantaged children loaded up with social capital and political savvy would be voting and staying consistently in the, in the voting habit. And that's exactly how it would be, these pictures sum it up. And that those kids in the bottom picture will have teachers um, making them get involved and assisting them to get involved, maybe grading them on their efforts to get involved. Finally, I've got to deal with this one. This is not nice. Penalties for failure to vote. And the conundrum is this. I myself have written a paper on uh, the fact that you need to have penalties, otherwise compulsory voting doesn't work. You need enforcement. Now, they only need to be mild penalties, and it is mild here, 20 bucks in the, in the federal election. But it needs to be followed up and that there needs to be a fine imposed. You're not going to get the raising turnout in a socially even fashion effect unless you have enforcement. We want everyone to vote at, uh, to turn up. What should we do? Then when I was going through the United Nations minimum standards for how we should treat children, I came across this. We should take political uh, proper measures to make sure we're not exposing children unduly to the law and criminal sanctions and intervention. Again, it's like, oh, I've got a problem. So a lot of people in the submission said, because of this concern, we, shouldn't, we should still make it voluntary. But Luke Beck, uh, who I always have a lot of time for, says that, look, penalties are reasonable. 16 and 17 year old drivers are, uh, are not exempt from the far more severe penalties for breaches of road rules. That's true, but the stakes are higher to a certain extent in road rules. Or else he says, why don't we recommend empowering the electoral commissions to waive or reduce fines in cases of genuine financial hardship? Alternatively, we could impose very much milder penalties, such as the penalties in the ACT model, which are half what the penalties are for adults. All right, I'd better stop now and try and get out of here. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. So proud of myself. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name's Dani Larkin and I'm a Bundjalung and Kanarikan woman from Grafton, New South Wales. Um, I work and live on Meenjin land, founded upon the homelands of the Turbul and Yagara peoples. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the original custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, who are the Ngunnawal and Yambri people of the Canberra region. I pay my respect to elders past and present, and I ex extend that respect to other Indigenous people who are present. When I think about the history of the franchise, I can't help but acknowledge the experiences of my Aboriginal ancestors. In doing so, I often think about not just the ways in which they were historically regarded as being not intelligent enough or capable enough, to understand the importance of the right to vote, which arguably most electors don't anyway in contemporary times. But I also think about the ways in which electoral laws and policies have over time inadequately misunderstood or have not properly addressed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander disenfranchisement issues due to a lack of political will by ministers in parliament. There are various direct and indirect barriers that limit the franchise to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country, which I'll highlight later in my speech. But what I truly would like to do is think about and discuss broader international standards at Australia's attitude to Indigenous citizenship rights when it comes to our political participation. This, in my view, takes us to a place that thinks about the consciousness of lawmakers and prioritisation of Indigenous political input when undertaking law and policy making processes. And it really does, in that regard, consider our enfranchisement in its most broadest sense. And I think from there we can think about what best practice might actually look like or should look like. 
Both self-determination and Indigenous peoplehood have become prominent collective Indigenous human rights that have been relied upon globally from Indigenous rights advocates to frame Indigenous political struggles within settler state political systems. International standards, particularly those contained within the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, oblige Australia and other signatory colonialist states to uphold self-determination rights within their domestic laws, their policies, their processes and their institutions. That obligation also requires those states to act without limitation and ensure its Indigenous people have access to freely determine their group's political, economic, social and cultural development. Now, while there's no specific legislative definition for the term political participation, the international community has described it as citizens' activities affecting politics. In theory, citizenship should enhance and empower the status of individuals as members of their respective states. And as a universal entitlement, citizens should have full and equal access to all civil rights that underpin their citizenship to their state. So what is the reality then in Australia? Well, in practice, full access to citizenship rights and entitlements in Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people often fails to provide us mob with access to such rights equally compared to other citizens. So there exists in Australia substantial inequality barriers when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people accessing rights that, that underpin their citizenship, such as voting rights. And this is because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have, unlike our non-Indigenous counterparts, experience with political exclusion and marginalisation treatment in Australia at both the sub-national and national level of governance. And this is a consequence we continue to live with daily from colonisation and dispossession. We also have distinct different internal, differing internal cultural identities that Australian governments often fail to understand, respect and recognise and instead require within their democratic framework individuals to transcend their differences to assume an impartial general point of view as part of their citizenship obligations. But self-determination rights applied through political rights and autonomy rely on the principle of democratic equality to nurture and to sustain Indigenous group differences through specialised rights policies and or state funded institutions like what we're considering now in Australia, a First Nations voice to parliament. We must appreciate how those sorts of special measures are necessary for a state to adequately acknowledge and understand the injustices Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have faced as a product of colonisation. Such special measures should focus on providing equitable outcomes to marginalised Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are faced with structural barriers that limit their full participation in society and political processes. Citizenship and structural assurances sit synonymously with one another and the task for the Australian government is to ensure necessary legislative and policy respect is given to differentiated members of society like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, whilst also treating those members as equals. Yet, just prior to our last 2022 Commonwealth election, we saw the Morrison government attempt to add additional red tape to voting at Commonwealth elections by requiring all electors to provide photo ID prior to casting their vote on election day. Now, thankfully that proposal was rejected, but if it weren't, the result would have been, would have not provided much incentive and accessibility to electors who are already disenfranchised to politically engage. And this would have been so particularly for people who are financially vulnerable, living in poverty, residing in remote communities with minimal support, um, support and access to services, with also a spread out population making it much harder for those people to find someone to vouch for them when it comes to voter ID requirements, which are largely people who are homeless, Indigenous and those with a disability. 
Indigenous people, in fact, occupy a large proportion of the population statistics for each of those vulnerable categories, despite being less than 3% of Australia's overall population. But according to international standards, there should be as few barriers to Indigenous people casting their vote at Australian elections as possible. So I reflect on this experience to highlight precisely what is wrong when it comes to the Australian government's initial attitude of failing to respectfully and adequately prioritise including its Indigenous people in political decision making, even by way of voting at an election. The attitude flows on into deeper ramifications when it comes to Indigenous political representation. Representation that's separate from relying on Indigenous candidates alone who must represent their electorate, not just Indigenous interests. And it also flows on into overall law and policy making processes within the Australian legal system. These issues, as the Uluru Statement from the Heart observes, are the torment of our powerlessness in this country. A way in which the Australian Electoral Commission has sought to combat this problem of disenfranchisement amongst potential electors, particularly those who are of Indigenous descent, is by offering those electors the option for direct enrolment. And this is the federal direct enrolment and update policy, which is being trialled in remote communities in Western Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland. But what it does is enable the AEC to use trusted third party data to enrol people without them having to initiate the transaction. And this requires notification to the individual of the enrolment action that the AEC is proposing to take. But with enrolment bound to a physical address, it's something that's prove, proven challenging in remote communities because ultimately the trial will involve notifying people living in remote communities of their direct enrolment um, via email and um, community mailboxes. Now, this initiative was particularly problematic for the Northern Territory um, and Aboriginal electors residing in the Northern Territory. And that was for the last Commonwealth election. And that's because a large portion of the Territory's population live in widespread out remote communities without a postal address and or access to internet and an email. Now, to give you a snapshot of the statistics, Aboriginal people make up 30.3% of the population in the Northern Territory, yet they account for 88% of its homeless population. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the five Australian regions with the highest percentage of homelessness people um, are all located in the Northern Territory. And there are also severe overcrowding issues where Indigenous homes require four or more additional bedrooms, and that accounts for the majority 81% of the Northern Territory's homelessness rate. There are also issues in the Northern Territory with rough sleeping arrangements, which are on the rise, particularly in Darwin City and in Catherine. And rough sleeping involves people having to sleep in improvised dwellings, tents or sleeping out. Now, a lot of these issues can obviously impact the accessibility Aboriginal people um, have in the Northern Territory to enrolling and to casting their vote. But they're also going to lack incentive and prioritisation to enrol and to vote when their day-to-day -day living conditions are so dire and stressful. The Northern Territory Land Council has said that as many as 40,000 people could have been left off the roll in the Northern Territory for the last Commonwealth election because the AEC hadn't applied the policy in remote communities which directly or automatically enrols people using data from Centrelink, the ATO um, and motor vehicle registries to add voters to the electoral roll. So what had happened at our last Commonwealth election was that the AEC um, had essentially excluded Indigenous people, um, not necessarily un um, intentionally, but they had excluded Indigenous people without a postal address from the electoral process because they can't automatically enrol these people um, to vote if they can't send them a written notice. Um, and of course, many residents in the Northern Territory live in remote communities um, and barely have access to even a community mailbox. So, what do we do about problems like this? Well, most Aboriginal people will have access to a phone or someone else's phone, so that's one additional means to contact them. Um, there could be an internet registrar um, and or the AEC could work with local land councils. Um, 
Aboriginal medical services to notify them of uh, persons who are living in their region that they're enrolled to vote for the next election. Um, they could provide AEC local caseworker jobs for Indigenous people in the area um, who know where people on the enrolled list actually live and they could go out and tell them. Um, that's usually how community um, works in those types of regions. Um, so I would say, you know, quite generally speaking in this day and age, that there's many options to inform people. Um, but such efforts require appropriate support and funding by the Australian Government. But I also do note the passing of the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Act 2023, um, which has sought to modernise the nation's referendum rules and bring them into line um, with election laws. And of course, I do also note how recommendations for that act to adopt on the day enrolment failed, um, which is also disappointing as that would have further fostered Indigenous political participation given the dis disproportionate enrolment rate. Um, and it would be for, of course, um, an upcoming referendum question about a First Nations voice to Parliament and the government to represent our interests. Um, but I do note the government's $16 million commitment to assist Indigenous enrolment in advance um, of the vote by extension of remote bo mobile polling, um, and that's from 12 days to 19 days to allow the AEC more time to reach hard to access places across the country. Um, and, and that's important. That's an important measure for, for polling booths to remain open and accessible for electors in remote communities for longer periods of time, given they're usually shut down after a few hours because of electoral commission staffing issues, um, which can be a barrier for Indigenous electors casting their vote all the same. But while there's a focus on improving enrolment rates, another thing to consider is the penalties that people face when they've not casted their vote on election day despite being enrolled on the electoral roll. So while it's all well and good, we try to get as many people um, as possible, particularly Indigenous marginalised people, enrolled to vote for an election, there must be follow through with this consideration. Um, and consideration of all barriers and issues that Indigenous people might face when it comes to actually casting their vote on election day. Um, so increasing alone just enrolment statistics, um, yes, that's a starting point, um, but that's, that's, those statistics alone aren't the end measure, okay? There's a, a, a variety of different things that need to be done in that respect, and enrolment rates alone are not indicative of fully supported um, um, and just indicative in general of Indigenous political participation when it comes to voting. Um, the only other issues that I'd add are the issues of electoral disqualification of those who are serving lengthy terms of imprisonment and those who are deemed of unsound mind according to electoral legislation. And what we know statistically for both, um, we're told this by annual Closing the Gap reports, is that Indigenous people occupy high rates of incarceration and usually serve a sentence of imprisonment um, much longer than their non-Indigenous counterparts convicted of the same crimes. Um, so they're serving also lengthier terms of imprisonment, which usually captures them um, in these electoral disqualifications. We know that Indigenous people occupy um, high rates of having a disability and according to the Australian Law Reform Commission's Pathways to Justice reports, particularly that of 2017, that um, most incarcerated Aboriginal people are also likely to be affected by mental illnesses and illiteracy issues. So both of those types of vulnerabilities amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can also place um, them at risk, at greater risk of being disqualified from casting their vote at elections despite being enrolled. So there needs to be both policy and legislative reform to overcome these issues because when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do not see themselves or their experiences within the Australian constitution and electoral legislation, they become alienated from the political process. And for those, um, it's problematic for those who seek to um, be politically recognised, to um, you know, politically exercise their sovereignty, who seek to engage in voting 
and aspire for reform of the Australian system so that the majority rule accommodates their aspirations as an Indigenous minority. Um, and, you know, it's, it's evident that voting and political inclusivity on those terms um, is essential. And this will be particularly so with the upcoming referendum, um, a question that will be posed to the Australian people for a First Nations voice that our Labor government has committed to. Indeed, it will be most important that there is, are as many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not just enrolled, but actually voting on this question as possible. So I'll leave it there, um, and I welcome questions and comments that you might have for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take my prerogative as chair to um, to, su <laughs> to summarise. Sorry, I'm being heckled. Um, to summarise the three talks uh, in a way that will hopefully prompt some questions. So, something that really um, stuck out for me when when all of you were speaking is how we don't have an objective or a, a necessarily kind of first principles idea of what the franchise should be. Lisa's probably the closest that she wants a big franchise, um, whatever that may look like, because more people voting is better for democracy. And I tend to, um, to be very sympathetic to that view. But if you asked me to name exactly, you know, to delineate exactly who should vote and who shouldn't, uh, it struck me for the first time in my life that I couldn't actually tell you. Um, our franchise as it stands in Australia is deeply path dependent. Um, although we think about ourselves, as I said at the start, as being very inclusive and, and relatively universal, I mean, that phrase doesn't even really make sense. Um, to be relatively universal in terms of suffrage means that we are, by definition, disenfranchising some people. Um, I think Dani's point about how fran franchisement came about for Indigenous Australians was deeply... Um, you know, deeply embedded in the idea that some people are smart enough to vote and others aren't. And um, while that that is uh, the most obvious, I think, with regard to Indigenous enrolment, it does, you know, it does trickle throughout the whole system. There is a point at which we've decided that 16-year-olds aren't smart enough. We've decided that, um, you know, there are certain people in the population, and even Albanese doesn't have a good sense of this, as, as uh, Graham points out, you know, that it's about taxation, uh, you know, and no representation, no taxation without representation, but that doesn't really, um, that doesn't really come up anywhere else in our concept of, of enfranchise, enfranchisement either. To summarise, we don't have a good sense of, of what a good voter or a good electorate looks like. As it stands, we have a franchise that is potentially fungible, that we can go and trade with a country like New Zealand. Uh, I think the idea of, of uh, franchisement as being, uh, as if of enfranchisement as being tradable would f be fairly um, uh, distasteful to a lot of us, but it's happening around the world. We have uh, a sense of, of, of uh, enfranchisement as being a citizenship related right, but when we have so many non-citizens, what does that mean? And then finally, we have a sense of the franchise as being kind of a poll of the elite, of being uh, a survey of voters whom we deem smart enough or white enough or Australian enough or old enough uh, to have a say in the running of our country. I'm going to start with a question um, that Anna has sent through before uh, before the panel today to kick off the questions, and on that idea of a sort of epistocratic for, uh, concept of democracy, where only the smartest and brightest should be able to vote. I know this is something that Lisa's railed against, so I want to post this to uh, pose this question to Lisa and to Dani. What do you make of the current voting arrangements in Australia with quite complex um, ballot papers, where we're going out into communities, whether they're heavily migrant, whether they're heavily indigenous, anywhere with sort of uh, high rates of uh, illiteracy, for instance, where we almost set voters up to fail? Um, what do you guys have to say that I think it's a particularly um, kind of insidious form of disenfranchisement in Australia? Is it something that we need to address? 
Do I have to get a mic? Oh, I think that's on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um I remember like when that changed, like the system sort of changed in 2016, and um you know the amount of sort of informal votes um that sort of got captured or didn't get captured actually after that. But um, look, I get you know. I get very disheartened when I think about these types of things because I just, I feel like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were always forgotten about, particularly, you know, um, our elders, our old people, Aboriginal brother, brothers and sisters, you know, in remote communities um, who speak language still, thankfully, you know, um, this is a positive thing, but, you know, it just, it's disappointing that the Australian government isn't being fair dinkum about, you know, properly ensuring that its laws, electoral laws and policies, its political system um, is being supportive and inclusive in this in that way. So, you know, making sure that the AEC is um, appropriately funded to be able to hire more, um, you know, um, people to speak language to different, you know, elders, uh, community members across the country. Um, we need more of that. We need more support um, when it comes to understanding basic civic, civics education, but also understanding the way in which the political system works. Like I myself have done a PhD in this and I still don't understand it. <laughs> I still don't under, it was on, on the constitution and I'm still struggling every day. I get confused every day. So I can only imagine how confusing it is for not just the everyday lay person, but also um, disenfranchised, excluded, forgotten about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, living out in remote locations across the country. So I think it's only fair, if we're talking about having a fair and equal and inclusive democracy and properly adhering to those types of best practice standards when it comes to political representation of um, all constituents' interests, including those that are Indigenous, um, we need to make sure then that the types of special measures are properly being implemented through laws and policies um, and the pr appropriate uh, support assistance so that people can properly vote, cast their vote with confidence, understand um, the politics behind that, but then also um, have their vote counted. So. Thanks, Dani. Um, uh, I'd like to add something about uh, our high, informality, high informal voting rate, which is quite high and all compulsory voting systems do have a high informal vote rate. But it's also, and that's because you're getting uh, a lot of minorities voting that you don't get in other systems. You get poorer, less educated people voting, um, people who, who don't speak the dominant language. That's not a reason not to have compulsory voting. But on top of that, we have a very complex voting system. And what we get in exchange for this complex voting system with proportional preferential voting is a much richer choice. And you do need to have that kind of complex voting system if you're going to have compulsory voting because you can't just herd everybody into a say, say it was a first past the post system. Imagine what a dispiriting experience that would be when a huge, huge swathe of the population would know that their vote wouldn't count because they were in a safe seat. Here you can get some degree of choice. So that's the price we pay um, for our high informal, uh, for, for inclusion and choice is a high informal voting rate. But at the same time, I think in a country with compulsory voting, you know, this is what I, something I firmly believe and would make me very unpopular with a lot of educators, but I think every high school student should not be allowed to graduate unless they can prove they can cast a formal vote. It should be taught and then they should be able to cast a formal vote. Now, I'm not saying that people should always cast formal votes. Sometimes it's quite good if people cast a protest vote and, don't, you know, they could, people can do what they like on their ballot, but they should be able to have the freedom to be able to cast a formal vote if that's what they want to do. And this is not something that's really properly taught and universally in our schools, and why not? What could be more important than voting and getting your voice count? And yet they teach us all kinds of other stuff. Uh, algebra, I'm still struggling with what that was all about. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even struggling, I don't even try. But 
casting a, casting a formal vote, what could be more important? So. We can't, we can't really overcome the costs of complexity, though, and we can't, and the costs of complexity aren't borne equally. So how do we get around this? Commissions actually do do, do a mountain of work to overcome. Uh, well, we, we do do things like we can have savings provisions. Yeah. And some states and some, some jurisdictions do it better than others. There'll be a certain degree of interpretation. They can't do too much interpretation because that can be a problem. You can educate. Uh, electoral commissions will put in a polling place um, interpreters and they'll have a, people will have a badge saying, you know, uh, I, I can interpret you. You can have assistance to go into the polling place. But it's really a question of people running tests. I mean, there are tests actually on the, uh, the election com commission sites. We can have a, a tester and learn how to, you know, I do see the electoral commissions doing a lot of work, but there's still more work needs to be done, and that means money. Mm. We do have a few things like, uh, so there's photographs on Northern Territory ballot papers. Uh, we have logos now, which is, you know, a pictorial way of, uh, of, uh, of trying to assist. Can I just raise the point, I mean, when the, in answer to your question, but also it relates to Elise's topic about uh, minimum age, uh, back in centuries of yore, say to the late 19th century, the privilege to vote was uh, explained as uh, for people who were independent. I know that was also a, a way of uh, you know, hiding class and gender distinctions, um, but it still got to an ideal. And I think it, this is certainly when I talk to, to a lot of my students who aren't necessarily in favour of lowering the voting age, even though they tend to be the sort of people who would nerdily wanted to have voted earlier. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I see it in my own family. Uh, one daughter went to a selective high school and couldn't wait to vote. The other one went to a local refugee-based high school and couldn't be asked. And uh, now I'm an ethical parent. I wouldn't have ordered a postal vote and voted for her, but there will be parents <laughs> who do that, and that could have a skewing uh, process. But it seems to be the one thing we don't... Maybe, maybe it has been raised before, but we talk about voting at 16 or 18. Very few people will vote at 16 or at 18. We have three-year terms. You're actually, on average, going to be voting uh, currently when you're 19 and a half or 20 <laughs> at state level, and and hence 17 and a half or 18 um, under your proposal. Um, the best thing I think I imagine for lowering the voting age would be that might, if it's compulsory, to habituate people earlier on, as long as they don't get that terrible first experience <laughs> of being hit with the, the fine, even if it's only only $20 or $50 at state level, and it is higher in some states because it has less salience. I know the Northern Territory Electoral Commission has expressed how hard it is to convince people in remote communities to that it's a privilege to vote when voting is seen as like a white man's business. So is there a, is it intractable? What a question, Danny, I'm sorry. Is, the, is, the, is it intractable? You know, how, how do we make the privilege of voting feel like a privilege for very disadvantaged communi communities? I'm not sure if like privilege would be the word that would come to mind for them, <laughs> especially remote. Um, look, I think it's, look, it all centres around being able to be, and you know, Lisa was kind of talking about this, but it's about being equipped and supported to make your own choice. So there's, many Aboriginal people across this country who, um, for their own, you know, acts of sovereignty, exercise of sovereignty, their own reasons, maybe it's just utter disillusionment from the Australian system altogether, um, who choose to just not opt in. And, and that's perfectly fine and I completely respect that and I completely understand that. It's about, though, empowering people to be able to have a choice and for, you know, my people from my side of the fence, that's never happened. Like this country has just, it continuously excludes and marginalises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And, you know, at, at what point are we going to get to where we need to start compromise, actual political inclusivity, compromise, shifting our consciousness to one that's more considerate um, and inclusive of Indigenous voices and representation because we all thought we were going to get that in the 1967 referendum. We thought when, you know, power was shifted to the Commonwealth, you know, the race's power, that there would be this dialogue and that we wouldn't need a voice, a First Nations voice at a Commonwealth level. That was what was meant to happen afterwards. But 
all these years after, we can see that the system's still flawed and there lacks um, political will from ministers that pass through parliament each different election to properly um, adhere to best practice when it comes to making decisions on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. Um, and so what happens is, is when you're not voting, you know, you're not part of the customer, you know, customers that are they're capturing and, and thinking about when it comes to law and policy making. And it's evident, like it's evident every year in the closing the gap reports, it's evident in all the statistics that we have and the Royal Commission's inquiries that we do to undertake our truth telling and reflect on what's going on. But at the end of the day, the long and short of it is you need to be able to vote in ministers that are going to go in and put skin in the game and bat for, bat for you and your group. Um, and if you can't even at least choose to do that, like, then the, the, the system remains the same. It remains broken and majority rules and we put a heap of funding into, um, you know, creating different support services and then taking them away and then thinking about it and changing it up again and it's the same old cycle over and over again. Um, it would be actually more cost efficient to actually just adhere to best practice, go out, um, sit with community, make sure that they're um, encouraged to vote, add, give them some hope. Um, I think the voice to parliament um, you know, it has, has created a huge shift in the mentality across many Aboriginal communities in this country. Um, it gives us hope. Um, now, whether or not it's successful at a referendum, I hope it is. I'll be really disappointed if it's not. And a lot of, you know, it's only going to create a wider gap when it comes to trust um, between Aboriginal people and the state. But I think this idea should be taken up as an opportunity to go, okay, let's, let's actually use this to really encourage and motivate and politically include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. It's a way, it's an avenue of hope. Um, and a, it's a, it's a way in which we can have a reset on how our democracy is. Um, I think sometimes they're a little bit hard on the AEC and their work in remote communities because they're explicitly restricted from saying exactly what you've just said, right? Which is, this is the only way you're going to get changed. They can't pass on that message. Um, do we have, we've got questions. Uh, the lovely Alyssa is going to pass around microphones. Michael Maley first. Thanks for very fascinating uh, contributions from everybody. <coughs> Uh, I'd like to pick up on a few points, um, starting with Jill's observation about uh, principles underlying the franchise. I think this is a fundamental point, and also r relating to um, the issue about New Zealanders that Graham talked about. If you look back at the introduction of the citizenship-based franchise in 1984, it wasn't driven by um, any sort of new sense of nationalism it was a result of the recommendation of the Galbally Report on Post-Arrival Services for Migrants, which specifically looked at voting rights and said that there were anomalies that should be resolved such that all migrants should be placed on an equal footing in their voting rights, quote. And it was the, the choice of citizenship as the basis for the franchise was to produce that non-discriminatory equality of the franchise. The problem I see with enfranchising New Zealanders as a one-off is that you effectively also abandon that principle that was enunciated by Galbally without making it clear what principle would be replacing it. And then you get into all sorts of paradoxes and anomalies because you can talk about things like kinship, uh, and we have some sort of kinship with New Zealanders. Is that less than the kinship we should feel with Papua New Guinea, where Australia was an administering um, authority in the territory for decades and decades? Once you start trying to come up with these vague sorts of concepts of they're our good friends and maybe they're not so, such good friends, you cannot help but get back into a discriminatory environment again. And that becomes problematical not just for electoral purposes but for your foreign relations when you may look at countries um, that, that uh, see us as friends, but they look at us and say, well, you're not so friendly with us as you are with other countries in the Pacific. So that becomes quite difficult. And uh, to take that um, just a little bit further, 
into the issue of reciprocal rights. They let us vote, so why shouldn't we let them vote? That may be quite problematical for countries which, for example, may have the franchise specified in their own constitutions, which may not be able to be readily modified to make it possible for Australians to vote there. So you then have people in Australia who are disadvantaged by that relative to their next door neighbours. And uh, that then becomes highly problematic, a lot of thought. Um, you also have the issue of um, compulsory enrolment and, and voting for people in that category as well. I argued in a JSCIM submission that the principle we should be working from is that voting is a collective effort of the Australian political community and we should seek to define that by whatever arguments that seem appropriate and then use that the, the upshot of that analysis as the basis for determining the franchise. Once you start getting into this notion of reciprocal rights like reciprocal Medicare or reciprocal um, visa um, free travel, you get into a mess that you're never going to get out of. So that, that, that to me is very problematical. Um, could I just make a second point which is to do with, with um, ease of voting and, and electoral reform. I had a look at the AEC website yesterday. They put up a, online a thing where you can practice voting for the referendum. And you write words in to the squares and it tells you whether it's formal or not. And uh, Jeremy Gans pointed out on Twitter that if you put yes in inverted commas, as it appears on the ballot paper, uh, the website will tell you that that's not a formal vote. Uh, I actually put all sorts of affirmative expressions in which would have made my point of view quite clear and I kept getting told that I wasn't, it wasn't a valid vote. That raises really, I think, quite a fundamental issue because our formality rules are disenfranchising. If you mark your ballot paper, one, two, three, four, for all the candidates on a House of Representatives vote, it's formal. If you put tick, two, three, four, it's informal. I define anybody to say how your intention there is not clear. Um, it, the worst example of this structural disenfranchisement with the Senate voting system for many years where you had to number every square on the ballot paper and that meant correctly numbering 73 candidates of the 1974 double dissolution in New South Wales. Ticket voting, which now a lot of people spit on, was specifically designed to get around that problem and it got around it very effectively for some years until the parties figured out how they were going to game the system to, to corrupt it. Which highlights a couple of things. One is that uh, electoral reforms are almost always a response to an existing problem rather than an attempt to create perfection from day one. Uh, but secondly, that how they work in practice is going to very much be affected by how political parties structure their um, strategies in response to the opportunities which a particular reform or change may uh, produce. So the search for perfection is a difficult one. Thanks for letting me go on about that. We may collect a couple of questions. Uh, there was one in the middle. Yep. Uh, thanks. Uh, one of the groups we've left out in terms of who gets to vote, what about the role of local candidates? Uh, if I was a Lagra spender, boy, I'd be out there after those young New Zealanders in Bondi. Um, all of these things play out at a local electoral level. Um, I lived in Melbourne for many years in a highly ethnic um, electorate, and the work that went into getting that, well, diverse ethnic vote was really considerable. Um, so I think we, it's, the AEC does a lot of work, but there's also a lot at the local level. You only have to sit in a local member's office to see uh, what goes on. I guess this is one of the major advantages of compulsory voting, that candidates have to appeal to everyone. But I guess um, leading up to the, the question, is how is this going to play out or any of the changes? The age of the population varies a lot, the age structure from area to area. Um, how much difference would that make and some of the um, other conditions? Is it, are most electorates going to be impervious to these effects and where, 
will they be swinging electorates or whatever? Um, I guess just a final point on the young vote. Um, young people do have parents, most of whom do see, look after their children's best interests, perhaps not all of them. They, they themselves also have older parents. And I think we can um, make some very false thing claims about intergenerational relations. I think they're much more class-based than age-based. Are there any more questions while our rovers are on their feet? Um, Dani and Lisa, you, you both kind of talked, touched on um, the previous government was looking into voter ID. I know that legislation wasn't um, uh, put into to force, but I just wanted to particularly ask you, Lisa, about, you know, if, if we are going to lower the voting age and potentially uh, ask young people to enrol from the age of 14. Mm. Do you see there being any issues around, you know, ID in being able to register? And I wonder if you could expand maybe a little bit on what would be required for young people from the age of 14 to be able to enrol. And maybe Dani, you could look, give your perspective on that as well. If, if the voting age was lowered and, and people could enrol from the age of 14. Do you think that would, um, that Indigenous people would be able to, to have, be able to enrol based on the current legislation, if you know what I mean? Thanks. We might start on that one and go backwards, if you'd like. I want to first of all commend Lisa for convincing me, the parent of a 16 year old, that 16 year olds should be able to vote because I didn't think anyone would be able to do that. But you won me over. Yeah, I won myself over too. Yeah, no. I, I couldn't get my son out of bed literally before five to, to vote in the last election. Uh, but still, I just think it's not about me. <laughs> um, with the ID look in Australia, a bus pass would be enough, frankly, because we do not have interference and corruption. We don't need a lot of ID. But the thing is, 14 year olds are in school. So if they're enrolled in school, and let's assume they're enrolled under their, their real name, and under their real identity, we could, we could, we could do that in school. Um, but the ID, the ID arrangements for enrolment aren't a concern for me, unless we were to start seeing a high levels of manipulation of the role or interference, but I doubt it. We just do not have that kind of culture here. And it always makes me anxious whenever I hear ID requirements mentioned in the context of uh, voting in this country, because it, it, to me, I always associate it with voter suppression anyway, because we do not have a problem of multiple voting. Um, but, you know, who's to say what will happen, happen in the future? But the thing about young people uh, from 14 to, to 16 is that they're, they're still in school. And so they're kind of a captive audience for a lot of things. You could even set up polling places on a school day <laughs> in school. Um, but you could educate these. You've got a better opportunity to educate young people now that they're required to vote. Uh, this, this could mandate schools to educate them on how to vote formally. Uh, so many good things could come out of it, and possibly some bad things, but I, I don't, I'm not worried about uh, ID. What, what were your concerns there, that they, the young people wouldn't have the ID that they'd need? Well, I, I, the less hurdles, the better, as far as I'm concerned, in an environment where interference is low, which is exactly what we've got here, so we're very lucky. Did you want to add anything, Dani? Yeah, um, I suppose, like, my only concern when I sort of raised that was, um, well, there's a birth certificate, you know, issue mm -hmm. within um, Australia amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And so there's this whole experience and situation that kind of gets you know left behind and forgotten about and basically you know there's a lot of aboriginal um parents who they they themselves don't even have a, a birth certificate and you you see this kind of issue occurring in um you know really really bad poverty stricken indigenous communities where you know they're they're struggling to just get through the day to survive to in some locations have access to just basic human rights like water, um, you know, and so um, 
the last thing that's on their list of priorities is to go out and pay a fee to get a birth certificate. And this can be an issue, one, because then they're unable to, if they're also unable to vouch, have find someone, if they live really, really remote, find someone to vouch for them and it's just red tape and another barrier um, that kind of, you know, contributes to this lack of incentive that Indigenous people in those situations will have. Um, but it, it, it's an issue when it comes to enrolment. Um, and it's also, um, you know, an issue as well with one of, indirectly so, with one of the electoral disqualifications of, um, you know, potentially being disqualified if you're serving a lengthy sentence of imprisonment. So accumulated, um, you know, criminal activity on someone's criminal history um, can also put you back into prison for a lengthier term of imprisonment. And I've seen this happen a lot. Like I used to work in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal service out in Roma. And um, there would always be repeated offences. The times were lengthier and lengthier each time one of my clients um, re-entered back into incarceration. Um, and it's this whole culture and attitude of, you know, being forgotten about, the government doesn't care, why the hell would I even opt in or, you know, go to any extra additional length to try and, you know, get around some of this red tape to vote because it, what's it going to matter anyway? And so that's what I like before with the voice, it gives and, and ideas of treaty and progression like that. It, it changes that sentiment within community and people have really latched onto that over the last few years because they have hope. And so they're a little bit more open to trying to engage, but that, there has to be compromise. There has to be support um, that meets those types of interests to, 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 to make sure that they're enrolled and they vote. But in terms of, you know, um, younger people voting that are Aboriginal, um, you know, we'll, those types of issues can be an issue, not having even like enough money to get your own driver's license. So, you know, that was sort of the point I was hitting on before, but mm. then I went off track. But, um, you know, if you don't have a birth certificate, you're unable to get, you know, your driver's license. And sometimes when you're that remote and there's an emergency sort of situation, you see it happen all the time. Mums with like two of their kids and then three other kids from community, putting them in the car, doing a huge drive to either the hospital to take care of old people. You know, we're always sick as a um, cultural group. And so, and you have these types of, you know, um, kinship responsibilities, you've got to take care of each other. So it's being put in these situations without a means legally to properly undertake some of these things where you're vulnerable. Um, and you're left, um, you know, with a greater likelihood of being institutionalised via incarceration or even a detention centre if we're talking about young kids. Um, and so what needs to happen? Well, the AEC can work with like births, deaths and marriage, marriage officers across the country and maybe there can be some sort of policy strategy that, you know, does outreach and tries to work with Indigenous people in communities without a birth certificate or ID. Um, to get that, um, but I think it would be really beneficial, you know, given the median age of Aboriginal people is quite young, to pick up on those voices because when you sit back and look at their life experiences, like the life experience of a 14-year-old Aboriginal, you know, young man is going to be very, very different to maybe even like a 21-year-old, um, you know, non-Indigenous, um, even white woman. Um, and so I think there's um, an opportunity to get like really, um, well, necessary input when it comes to picking up on constituents' experiences and then looking towards reform. Um, and, and, and that's beneficial. Um, so that's my two cents, I think. <laughs> yeah. Graham, we'll go to you on the, uh, the previous question, which is about who benefits? If we, if we see an influx of young New Zealanders, you know, does the, what happens to the seat of Vaucluse, for instance? I'm not an empiricist, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it to, to Lisa to talk about these things. But I think there's a bit of a, a tension here. We're saying, oh, compulsory voting is great because it, it means that uh, turnout is, is largely habituated and, and we also have a system that tries to make it convenient to vote and so on. But on the other hand, well, of course, political parties have an incentive and a role to to, to turn out uh, voters. So uh, I, I can't really comment on, on the incentives, but uh, 
Um, the only way you get rid of those things is by having non-marginal seats, by having proportional representation, by having something a bit more like MMP, I suppose, which is another way of addressing the complexity of preferential voting, uh, although it adds a different complexity because you have to think about your, your two votes, which we already do, given we have upper houses. Um, I did want to... Could I just push back on the, uh, Michael's points? Uh, it seems to me there's a bit of top-down thinking here. This idea that there's a single principle uh, to define the universal suffrage. Well, as, as Jill answered her own question, there's not a mosaic tablet being handed down from high. Of course, political communities expand, hopefully, and sometimes contract based upon all sorts of different pressures and arguments. Um, and it's not like a light switch on off. There, there's a grey area here. And I think the point I was making was that it's not unprincipled to enfranchise uh, New Zealanders, because we're talking about structurally and not just historically in kinship terms, uh, a distinct group, a very large cohort, who we are part of a free trade zone, part of a free movement zone. None of this has been done, uh, let, Jill used the word, trading, but this hasn't been done as part of a treaty where there's some kind of bribery or negotiation or hocking around about rights here. This would be something uh, to take a very large cohort of people who will certainly benefit from uh, having that extra political voice. The question, it seems to me, could be reduced down to this. Um, would permanent residents who aren't enfranchised feel resentful, rightly resentful? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me there's some parallels with the arguments that are sort of going on subterraneanly at the moment about, oh, Indigenous voice, but what about an voice for Chinese Australians, this and that and the other? Now, I don't think that kind of argument worked if we are talking about expanding the ethical circle, unless you can say it's being done for unprincipled reasons, which would be if the Labor Party heard suggestions, I don't know if they're true or not, has might have seen data that there are parts of the Gold Coast and parts of Sydney where there might be a, a larger New Zealand diaspora of, uh, of people who are possibly likely to be sort of swinging voters who might be brought on board with this. Uh, I don't know. They're not the sorts of arguments that I, I think should be uh, at the forefront. Um, and they certainly wouldn't be in any legislation. But we don't have a definition of the political community in our constitution. <laughs> uh, we don't have it from the High Court. It, it, it's not possible. It is something, obviously, we have to construct ourselves. But I do take Michael's points uh, very seriously. I think, of course, they're looking at the data. Of course. But there's, no, there's no reliable data because we're talking about um, assumptions about people, the way people may vote. And I think we are also talking about, as I said, not, not a group who could be labelled as a sort of a left wing or right wing, but a group that are probably fairly pr pragmatic given the nature of, um, of, of the New Zealand diaspora. I have, a, I have an honours student working on this. He should be watching. So hopefully he's, uh, he's working on this. And once he writes his thesis, we'll burn it so that the parties can never, can never abuse it for you know, nefarious ends. Lisa, the empiricist? How, how do I think it's going to affect... Um... Campaigning. Yeah, Campaigning and voting. Um, well, for a start, if, with, it, with lowering to the youth age, are we talking... Uh, the age, or are we talking about uh, enfranchising um, New Zealanders? Cause I think all of these questions, I think. I, I don't think it can actually... First of all, we shouldn't care what the effect's going to be electorally, but say with young people... Um, any inner city seats, it will be more likely to affect uh, turnout there and voting patterns there and informal voting rates as well. Um, I don't think we can predict any of these things. I'm, you know, you can't model it in your head, can you, at this point? I'm try. But you're the empirical person, really. <laughs> Have you, are you successfully modelling it right now? <laughs> no. No, I don't, think it, I don't think the outcome matters, but I think... We will get a higher rate of informal voting. I think understanding why different actors want more engagement in Indigenous communities or want compulsory voting for 16-year-olds or mm. want... Um, and I think the, the New Zealand case is the most stark um, of these three examples, why Albanese came out so quickly and wanted this on the table, I think it's absolutely worth interrogating. An effect we get today also is not the effect we get tomorrow. For example, when women were first enfranchised, they voted conservatively. And then mm -hmm. after a while, it was the opposite to the point where in the United States, I don't think any Republican government would ever have won if only women had voted mm -hmm. it for, for a lot, number of decades. So uh, these things are quite plastic. We can't predict um, and, and we can only uh, be committed to a principle. 
that either we like inclusion, and once we've decided what the inclusive principle is, uh, the usual, what, uh, the first protocol is the all affected principles in democratic theory, all affected interest principle. If you're affected mm. by the outcome of election, you should be enfranchised. But, by this, but then that is way too liberal. For example, uh, we should all be allowed to vote in American elections in that case, because <laughs> when America sneezes, we all catch a cold. So we'd have to really work out what we mean by affected. Um, mm. but, but really, we have to just work from the first principles and not worry too much about the effects because we live in a procedural democracy. We don't want to look at the outcomes. We want to look at it. We, we, judge, we judge the democracy by whether or not the procedure has been enacted properly. And that can mean being as inclusive as possible. The election is run properly with no corruption, with as much inclusion as possible, with as much opportunity to cast a formal vote and have access as possible. We don't, you know, I try not to think about um, outcomes, except when I'm arguing against people that say inclusion uh, stops the system from working well. Because when you look at any study that's ever been done on, on widening the franchise, I mean, I can't find or think of one study that shows that expanding the franchise made a system worse, a democ democracy worse. It only ever makes it better. Now, I don't know if I can predict that about uh, including um, nationals from another mm. setting, um, but I know of no study that shows that expanding the franchise makes things worse. I don't know why people are so scared of inclusion. Well, I do know why certain people are scared of inclusion and those reasons aren't morally compelling. Because, mm. But what you always get is making the system better, making people happier, spreading wealth, reducing corruption and actually increasing human flourishing. And so what's the problem? But if moral compulsion and electoral incentive were perfectly aligned, we wouldn't be having this panel because all of these things would have eventuated. Well, we're trying to make them eventuate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll eventuate them. <laughs> Dani, how do we get, how do we get Indigenous, you know, the sort of, you, you talk about special measures which would upset plenty of people in like mainstream Australian society, you know, whether white or um, indigenous or whatever, but the idea of special measures, how do we make that palatable in a, in a political sense? Um, I mean, we need to just reconcile with Australian history, right? Yeah. So first and foremost, the moment you're able to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty, and accept the history for what it is and accept that status for what it is, then I think everything makes sense. It's the denial of that. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I talk to people all the time about this, this status and this recognition and that's where all these rights come from. That's where the advocacy, you know, the activism um, comes from. It's from, it's this frustration, but the requests are so modest given the extent of yeah. history and disenfranchisement yeah. and it's ongoing. So um, it absolutely blows my mind. I nearly fell off my chair when I heard Graham talking about Māori um, people voting and I'm like, well, you know, this is what happens, you know. It's, you want the system to be inclusive, yes. Um, and I'd love to vote, you know, alongside my Māori brothers and sisters and everyone feel great about that. It's all an act of humanity, it's sounding like a pageant speech, but <laughs> I'm like, you know, there also comes prioritisation and, you know, that's the thing that people unfortunately get uncomfortable about, but this is the culture that's been created by dismissing what's happened and the status and recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's connection to this land. Mm. Like this institution that we are on is on stolen land. And if we can all wrap our heads around that and go, okay, so ought we in 2023 start looking at real meaningful ways in which we can properly include the first peoples to this country that this entire society and legal system that's imposed itself on these peoples Ought we, ought we have some input from them, given, you know, the extent to which they're living in deplorable living conditions and the amount of health, um, you know, and wellbeing issues that we are confronted with every day? 
but nothing gets. So I just, I just think it's really rich as well coming <laughs> when it's a immigrant nation. Okay. I mean, it's just, it absolutely, um, I'm, I'm going to say it actually, no, it doesn't baffle me at times. I think I'm just starting to <laughs> crawl back into my pessimist state. But I just I just think it's like the pot calling the kettle black. Literally, we're, we're in an immigrant country. You know, we need to understand whose country this is. We need to then properly show respect and accept the very humble, modest offerings of opportunity to come together and like you know, make our democracy actually work. Um, and I think, you know, if we actually listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who, you know, our old people out in community that might get forgotten about and they're overlooked because they're speaking their native tongue and maybe to the average, you know, observer that doesn't understand native languages across this country, um, it sounds like they're just rattling on about nothing. Um, if you actually sit down and open yourself to culture and open yourself to listening to Indigenous old people, you'll be amazed at the sophisticated um, offerings that they give to you when it comes to law and policy and political re reform. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart is testament of that. It is such a sophisticated, modest proposal. Um, and that comes from our old people that speak, you know, native tongue. They had to have about three or four interpreters at one stage in a room when those regional dialogues were going on and they were listening to old people, understanding it themselves and communicating to another interpreter um, who then had to interpret that into um, another person's language. And, you know, this is exactly how politics should work, um, but it doesn't. So we need to make space. It's not just about being inclusive. We need to actually make space and create a platform through things like the voice, through things like voting, um, it might, you know, eventually be, um, you know, um, designated seats in part. It'll be a range of different things. There's not a silver bullet to overcoming Indigenous disenfranchisement. It'll be a range of different things that are modified, adapted. They're evaluated, reviewed over time, and they're, they're adapted in a way that's always meeting the needs of its constituents' interests. And that's what laws and policies in this country are meant to do. That's a really interesting kind of dovetail with Graham's point about how this is always changing. There is no first principles um, franchise. We are updating and modernising. And, and I think in that context, the idea of special measures is completely self-evident. Um, someone's waving it. Do you want a question, Damon? I do. Thanks. <laughs> you brought your own mic? <laughs> I, I stole all this. Is. Um, so uh, a somewhat flippant question and then a uh, comment and then a question, um, the comment being that um, the history of electoral reform, the significant electoral reforms that we're known for in Australia, like compulsory voting, like full preferential voting, were all legislated originally for partisan political advantage anyway. Um, so why stop now? Um, but also in the fullness of time, the parties um, and sides of politics that tended to legislate them, uh, they've tended to work against them eventually anyway. Um, but uh, my question is more, and it's, it's a very electoral nerdy question, but I, I know I'm amongst friends here. Um, the uh, enrolment for Australian elections, uh, for federal elections, but also for most state and territory elections, is, is very location-based um, by legislation and also by administrative process, um, until it isn't, right? And Graham mentioned uh, overseas electors. and. Uh, when you're an overseas elector, the electorate that you enrol in um, is literally, well, where did you live last? Uh, and if not there, where do you have the strongest association with? You know, what, 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 what electorate do you identify with? Um, so, and the place-based enrolment is important for some things, like making sure that if you live close to a boundary, you are in the right place, you vote for the right elector. But if you're an elector in Lingari, for example, your address could be incorrect by hundreds of kilometres, literally, um, yet you're still voting in the same electorate. Um, we have special provisions for itinerant electors, um, which acknowledges that homelessness is an issue for a lot of Australians and homeless people still should be entitled to vote. Um, but generally, the... Uh, itinerant elect 
elector provisions are not used by, for example, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are quite mobile in their residence, but also for grey nomads, for example. So we've got lots of Australians, disproportionately Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but not exclusively, who are, you know, not tied to a specific location. Um, is, it, is it time that we sort of rethought how electoral enrolment works in Australia and this sort of very idea of place-based electoral enrolment. And of course, it's not nearly as much of an issue for voting in the Senate because um, you vote as a whole state um, and you know, fewer people cross state lines than cross electorate lines. Um, so just interested in your thoughts there. Um, yeah, potentially. Like, I mean, it's, it's a hard, um, it's a hard like, issue to sort of overcome, I suppose, because when you look at, yeah, the Northern Territory and you look at the amount, like, community there are so different, you know, um, compared to the community that even I grew up with. Um, so I grew up on an Aboriginal mission outside of Grafton, and that's so different. Um, like, our cultural identity is so different to Aboriginal people living in the Northern Territory. You know, those fellas are roamers, so, you know, they'll keep roaming around in the Northern Territory. They've got, you know, brothers, cousins, elders, you, you name it. And, like, that's how they live. It's a lot more sort of nomadic, I suppose, in that respect um, than, you know, someone that's living in kind of, like, the North Coast, New South Wales kind of thing. So, um, yeah, look, I think... I mean, as I said, I've tried to grapple with this in a variety of different ways. Like, I think, all right, well, who are these people? Some of them, you know, just don't simply want to vote. And they, you know, um, I know a lot of those communities are like, the system doesn't work for us. You know, we're not, we want to exercise our political sovereignty in this way and this is how we choose to. And, um, and, and they go off country and live on country. And so, um, and that's their choice, sure. But... Um, I think for those, like, I mean, well, yeah, how do we accommodate that? Is it just mobile polling? Well, that's, you know, limited. Um, there's a range of different things that can happen in a day as well once those booths are set up. So even if the AEC sent out a mobile polling booth, you know, there's still the issue of, all right, well, does this person actually have enough fuel to drive a few hundred k's up the road with half a dozen kids in the back seat um, who they've got to look after from community to go out and cast their vote on the day? Do they have, you know, a driver's licence to get there legally? Like, what... And so there's this whole experience um, and all these different factors that you try and... They're like little fires. You try and put out a fire and go, OK, well, we'll do more mobile polling booths. It's like, all right, well, OK, what happens, though, if someone can't attend that day? Well, should we, you know, adapt the um, applicability of the penalties provisions within electoral legislation so that um, Aboriginal people, you know, aren't picked up by that, especially with the federal direct enrolment um, policy. You go, okay, so that could be further marginalising our people. Um, is that an option? Perhaps, like, it might be, you know, what you've suggested and, and shifting the way in which enrolment occurs. It might be simply just having more caseworkers that are Indigenous that are also, um, you know, linguistically capable of communicating to community, not only on how to fill out the ballot paper, but um, a range of other different, you know, points, you know, that speak to civics education um, so that they can cast their vote confidently. Um, I'd say all of these things should be considered, but yeah, like potentially, you know, what you've suggested as well. I think that's pretty valid. Um, yeah. Just on the point about um, principle, but also linking the point about uh, uh, actual link to place, which is very, very fundamental to uh, electoral systems based upon districts and divisions and so on. Uh, we've only, had, I think, had one kick at the Americans so far today, which is unusual for a panel like this in this day and age. But um, can I, I mean, in the United States, which, which, which is clearly a country that would say, as a matter of principle, Citizenship is what binds us together, allegiance to the flag, etc. And so all US citizens abroad can vote. And I know a young gentleman close to one of my daughters who, who, who said that he recently, although he left Colorado at age 10, <laughs> voted uh, in the long ballot at the last election, November last year, including for the school, local school boards, <laughs> which is, seems quite bizarre to me and quite unprincipled in a society where otherwise you can have a green card and, and have no political uh, electoral representation, or even worse, you could live in Washington, D.C. or Puerto Rico and, and, not have, and have lesser 
uh, rights to vote than, than people in the States. But um, uh, <coughs> the, the question is, is well put about, about, about the, the, the link to place if in reality it is a huge electorate and uh, um, why would you need necessarily? I mean, the, the forms used to not require people to show uh, ID to, en to enrol. Uh, is the vouching system now, Michael, but can clarify that? Do you want to do you want to clarify, Mike? It's I know it's three thirty. I'm yes, I'm tapping my your money's worth today. Um, Very last. Yeah, well, you do have a system whereby you can still put an enrolment form in with a witness that that is confirming something, and what just what the witness is attesting on an enrolment form has never been all that clear. Whether it's just that I saw you sign, or whether that I know you're qualified. Um, I'd raise a bigger question: Why do we have a role? Um, you can run an election without an electoral roll. Uh, the uh, Zimbabwe independence election was run that way, as were the ATSIC regional council elections when ATSIC was still up and running. There are alternatives to having a roll, and I think we just sometimes accept it as, as something which is absolutely essential. You could have a vouching system um, where someone simply turns up um, and you know, someone else from the community vouchers that they're over 18 or 17 or whatever the age is there. There are all sorts of um, empirically effective systems for checking that people are qualified to vote, which have been used at elections around the world, but we still have this attachment to this list. Um, partly it's the convenience that it can be used for multiple levels of government. Um, but, um, you know, we, we sometimes don't dig enough into the the, uh, the basics of why we are doing this um, to, to have clarity on what are some of the other policy options that might be there. Similarly with voter ID, um, I've set up two voter ID systems in other countries where it was positively empowering. One was Cambodia in 1993 and the other one was East Timor in 1999. It doesn't have to be a mechanism of disenfranchisement. Um, sometimes it symbolises to people that sovereignty is being given back to them after periods of war or the like. You can almost always tell, though, whether it's um, in, done with good or bad intent. You only have to look at the resources that people are prepared to put into issue IDs and the lists that are generally available and acceptable. And if, if it's an NRA membership card is acceptable but a student ID card is not, you then know that it's being done for tendentious reasons. All right, Michael has thrown two bombs with uh, 30 seconds to go before 3.30. So we're going to take both of those as comments. Um, I do want to thank our three panellists first before we, uh, before we wrap up, uh, Graham, Lisa and Dani. Uh, if we can give them a round of applause. I want to thank Damon Muller from the Australian Parliamentary Library and also the uh, Electoral Regulation Research Network, of which I, uh, Michael, who threw those bombs at the end, uh, Peter Brent sitting behind Damon, and uh, we are all a part of the ACT branch, so this is a, a co-badged event today. Uh, I must thank Andrew Banfield for welcoming us all here today and letting his staff come. Uh, apparently, uh, he's been very benevolent and a good boss. Um, <laughs> is there anyone else we have to thank Melissa. apart from that? Oh, and Alyssa, who apparently is an organ all the organising behind the scenes that Damon has taken credit for, uh, and is apparently an absolute gem, plus the running around with questions. Um, I think you can get in touch with any of the panellists. All our contact details are available on the seminar website. I'm getting confirmation of that. Um, thanks for coming online. Thanks for being here on pers in person. And um, finally, thanks again for those excellent contributions. Our pleasure.